welcome again to the Explaining History podcast. And today I want to look at the very first few days of the foundation of Lenin's Bolshevik government, where Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin and Sverdlov, uh, a four-man group, managed to hang on to power somehow, despite their lack of knowledge of government or their lack of understanding of the workings of any departments of, um, of government, uh, and sometimes the sheer absurdities uh, that they visited or attempted to visit upon the still functioning uh, government departments of the uh, former provisional government. So today I'm reading from uh, Stephen Kotkin's uh, really, really uh, detailed biography of uh, Stalin, uh, the uh, first uh, volume of, of that. Um, and he, t- he starts um, in this section from the very beginnings uh, of the, the new Bolshevik regime. Um, and uh, I quote few street celebrations that accompanied um, or immediately followed the October Bolshevik coup in contrast to the giddy days during and after February to March 1917 but within a week Lenin was posing for sculptors and yet few thought this crazy putsch would last even before it had happened throughout the summer of 1917 Russia's press nearly all across the political spectrum, had spread the idea, as Pavel Milyukov recalled in 1918, that the Bolsheviks either would decide not to seize power as they lacked hope of retaining it, or if they did seize it, they would endure only the shortest time. In very moderate circles, the latter experiment was even viewed as highly desirable, for it would cure Russia of Bolshevism forever. So there lie some interesting clues uh, about the um, durability uh, of the regime. There were those who underestimated its ability to survive and those that assumed that once it ha- the Bolsheviks had seized power they would be unable to wield it. They quite literally would be uh, unable to make uh, departments of uh, government operate There would be insurrections against the Bolsheviks, there would be uh, a counter-revolution, and all the uh, kind of mechanisms to remove a a, a radical revolutionary party from power would uh, kick into play. Um, These, of course, were uh, assumptions that were um, misguided. Um, These were assumptions that were based on a kind of uh, the normal uh, functioning of politics, which had come to an end uh, some time before October 1917. Um, there were um, those who um, assumed uh, that if the Bolsheviks seized power, um, that the, they and the other parties of the left would fight it out between one another uh, and destroy one another and pave the way uh, for uh, a, uh, a right-wing counter-revolution, but also the provisional government itself, what would remain of the provisional government, would be destroyed as well. So this could favour um, a kind of proto-fascist uh, or um, authoritarian dictator of, of, of some description. However, people were surprised when the coup happened, um, and Lenin chose a cabinet government rather than abolishing the state itself um, and the Second Congress of Soviets um, uh, approved the formation of an all-Bolshevik government. And this was going to be the sticking point, the first sticking point of the new, um, the, of the new regime. Was it going to be a coalition of leftist organisations? Uh, some Bolsheviks, known, namely Lev Kamenev, uh, argued that this is what should happen. Uh, this was going to be something that Stalin would bring up with Kamenev uh, later on during the power struggle to succeed Lenin, and it would be ammunition against him during uh, the Stalinist show trials 20 years later. However, in 1917, 
um, the government that Lenin creates isn't the kind of government that Lenin had previously advocated, one in which uh, essentially the state was dissolved. Um, Lenin quickly realised that these sort of naive uh, notions that had been uh, the kind of ideas that revolutionaries with no experience of government tend to come up with um, was going to be uh, a, a sort of a, a non-starter. When he wrote a State and Revolution the following year, he was essentially um, carrying, he's essentially ending uh, a conversation that he had had with Bukharin, uh, Nikolai Bukharin, um, uh, some years beforehand, in which uh, Bukharin had uh, and Lenin previously, who had agreed that um, the state should wither away, uh, Lenin said, "Well, it should now be retained in order to bring about revolution in its fullest force, so that the state, which Lenin had always argued, was a device of class-based violence, i.e., uh, the ruling classes inflicting uh, their violence and control and authority uh, on the on the poor." Lenin said, well, this is true, it still can be that, except it is now a device for the proletariat to destroy enemy classes, and that's why we have to keep it. That's why we have to keep policemen and prison cells and courts and armies and, and that kind of thing. So the Council of People's Commissars, which was the cabinet-based government, um, was not made up of, of ministers, but this new revolutionary term, commissar, which was uh, a term directly lifted from the Paris Commune, from the term commissaire, um, uh, which originally comes from the Latin commissarius, which means the representatives of, uh, of the people themselves, that, that higher authority. The uh, provisional government um, had been obviously swept aside and it had the provisional government had always it being in provisional meant to be short term and uh, replaced with a, um, a a government elected by the people. And Lenin, in his view, said that the the revolutionary vanguard of the Bolshevik Party was a representative of the people. It spoke on behalf of uh, the working classes, even if it hadn't exactly consulted them. One of the things that the Bolsheviks have in their favour is that there were a large number of, of uh, red guards in uh, Petrograd, the revolution by this stage, only days old, um, had not spread to Moscow yet. Uh, the Red Guards in Petrograd were a working class, armed members of the working class, um, and they were uh, accompanied by uh, and uh, added by mutinous soldiers who had declared for the Bolsheviks and the sailors of, of uh, the Kronstadt naval base who had also declared for the Bolsheviks. Um, and the top brass of the army had kind of melted away. They were either had been either imprisoned by the provisional government or seized by the revolutionaries, by the uh, the Bolsheviks, um, or they had uh, given up in despair and uh, and gone into exile, you know, vanished, knowing that they could no longer control their uh, their men. So this is the the one card in Petrograd that the Bolsheviks have to play. They have. Uh, they, they have an overall control of military force. The regime consisted of four individuals, Lenin, Trotsky, Sverdlov and Stalin, um, all of whom were, had been uh, political exiles and, politi and uh, political prisoners, and none had any experience of government. So they had no administrative experience, they didn't know how government worked, and they didn't think that that was particularly necessary anyway. Uh, interestingly, that Stalin himself becomes an expert bureaucrat in the next over the next few years. Um, the fifteen members of the Council of People's Commissars um, had, between them, spent two centuries in Tsarist prison uh, and in exile. And um, in the Smolny Institute, where the, um, the Bolsheviks uh, and uh, the left uh, social revolutionaries uh, had taken over, uh, which had been a, a finishing school for noble girls, they um, camped out and turned it essentially into a, an armed centre of, of revolution. And it was here that the October Revolution and the immediate aftermath was managed from. 
um, the whole experience of the Smolny Institute, ha um, the, the whole um, process of developing the Smolny Institute into a, a, a Bolshevik centre, has the element of kind of farce to it. The, the old headmistress was actually still living upstairs from Lenin's office. Um, and uh, the uh, Sverdlov appointed one of the Konstant sailors as the commandant uh, of the institute, um, and it was uh, surrounded very quickly by soldiers and room by room, um, non-Bolsheviks, uh, those who were seen as class enemies, were uh, e evicted. Um, Lenin managed to uh, seize a, a kind of a large, grand uh, limousine-style vehicle, uh, a, a Turkar Mary, um, which was had formerly belonged to the Tsar, um, and it was it had been um, confiscated. Uh, this gives you an indication of the anarchy in St. Petersburg at the time. It was confiscated by the Bolsheviks from firemen who had also appropriated it and were going to drive it to Finland to sell it. Nadezhda Krupskaya, Lenin's uh, wife, um, said, Nobody knew Lenin's face at that time. In the evening, we would often stroll around the Smolny, and nobody would ever recognise him, because there were no portraits then. In another incident recorded in Robert Service's biography of Lenin, Lenin was uh, stopped in the street by armed robbers, um, when he was driving around uh, or being driven around Petrograd, gunmen hijacked, uh, sort of uh, stuck the car up, and he had to explain that he essentially ran the country to them. Uh, but they didn't really take that one very seriously or believe him. And it shows you that uh, they, uh, the regime at this point was uh, fatally weak. Uh, you can barely even call it a regime at all. Um, the Bolsheviks become a regime in their own right, really as a, pro as a uh, result of the civil war. Uh, at this point, um, nobody recognises their, their validity. Uh, the commissars set up offices inside the Smolny Institute and they tried to assert their authority over government ministries. So they would literally visit the government ministry buildings around Petrograd and initially um, had very little success. Um, Stalin um, was the minister, the commissar for nationalities. Um, but he had no ministry to actually take over because there hadn't been a, a minister for Russian nationalities before this point. Um, his deputy, Stanislav Petrovsky, um, who was a Polish Bolshevik um, uh, that had um, seized control of the telegraph station during the October Revolution, uh, found an empty table at the Smolny Institute uh, and on which he stuck a sign saying this is the People's Commissariat for Nationalities. And that was the beginning of Stalin's government ministry, a table. Stalin's office, when he eventually got one, was next to Lenin's. Uh, and uh, Lenin would call Stalin in uh, endlessly um, to uh, discuss things informally with him. Um, Lenin seems to have preferred to remain kind of slightly incognito behind the scenes. Um, and he offered the chairmanship uh, of the uh, new uh, Council of People's Commissars, uh, the Sovnarkom, to Trotsky, who turned it down. Trotsky became the Commissar for Foreign Affairs um, and gained a room within the Smolny, which had been the uh, former, uh, the, the quarters of the former floor mistress for the girls. Um, and Sverdlov continued to manage the Bolshevik party itself. So this was the world's most powerful dictatorship. This was the beginnings of the, uh, the, the longest and most uh, successful, for want of a better word, uh, dictatorial regime of the 20th century. Um, and what strikes you right from the get-go is the sheer absurdity of, of this. Um, Lenin had been little other in his revolutionary life than a kind of an, an agitator, someone that wrote revolutionary books and pamphlets, um, who presented 
obscurantist economic theses as to the uh, the crises of czarism and and capitalism, and for whom the First World War uh, and the destruction of the czarist state. Uh, presents him uh, and then the inability to create anything meaningful afterwards presented Lenin with a uh, an opportunity to cement himself uh, as um, a, a a dictator uh, but this is um, a, a dictatorship really really in, in all the, the very embryonic stages if you look at the way in which the, the Nazi dictatorship formed after January 1933, I think the the, the difference is is that um, the Nazi Hitler is essentially welcomed into power, uh, or if not guided into power, by pre-existing structures of power, pre-existing uh, processes of uh, appointing a chancellor, um, and most people at the time. Um, particularly the likes of Hindenburg, had every suspicion that a dictatorship might come uh, uh, about. Here was a coup that was carried out and was barely recognised as being such. The people uh, of Petrograd, after the, the day after the October Revolution, didn't really register that anything particularly important had happened. The level of uh, chaos and unrest of the October Revolution was nothing kind of out of proportion with the sorts of things that have been happening since February. But politics is kind of a game of catch-up, really. The fundamental shifts, shifts and changes happen in the world, and then it takes a little while for everyone else to register the significance of what has actually uh, occurred. And it's at that point, normally, that there is some kind of reaction uh, or, or acceptance. Trotsky, too, was a journalist. He, he turned out to be surprisingly uh, effective during the Russian Civil War uh, as a, a military commander, but he had little training in statecraft, in fact none, um, and he was able to be... Uh, he, was an, he was an orator uh, and, and not much more. Um, both Sverdlov and Stalin... Um, had been political organisers, um, uh, bordering on uh, the uh, kind of on, on the criminal in Sverdlov's case, um, but again, not policy makers. No idea of how to interact with, say, bureaucrats or civil servants, um, and no idea how to turn uh, policy in uh, policy ideas into uh, concrete action on, on the ground. They did what. People with revolutionary political education uh, invariably tend to do and issued decrees. They uh, abolished social hierarchy in law, civil ranks and courts. Uh, they declared social insurance for all wage workers without exception, as well as for the city and the village poor. Um, and Stephen Cockey writes, uh, announcing the formation of a Supreme Council of the Economy and a determination to enforce a state monopoly in grain and agricultural implements. The decrees were suffused with terminology like the modes of production, class enemies, world imperialism and proletarian revolution. Published under the name Vladimir Ulyanov Lenin and signed for him by Stalin, among others, the decrees were proclaimed to have the full force of law. In the meantime... The regime had no finances or functionaries. Trotsky failed in a multiple efforts to take over the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Building and Personnel. His first arrival there at Palace Square 6 uh, on November the 9th was greeted with derision, followed by mass desertion. True, his minions eventually found some petty cash in the ministry's safe, and Stalin, to fund his own commissariat, have, uh, Pest uh, had Pestovsky sponge 3,000 rubles from Trotsky. Peskovsky soon let on that he had studied some economics in London and was decreed head of the state bank. So once again, we have a, a kind of a conundrum here. How did this um, a kind of level of absurdity and amateurism uh, manage to cement itself into a, a powerful and ruthless dictatorship? where initially all it had was decrees on paper, no money, no civil service, and no credibility with any of the other organs of state, uh, no democratic legitimacy. 
Uh, and the answer, of course, is through revolutionary terror. And this was very quickly uh, the solution that Lenin would find. And within days, the uh, discussion shifted to uh, dealing with the question of class enemies uh, and using terror to reinforce the regime. The thing that the regime does have, the, the thing it does have, hand it does have to play, is that of state violence in uh, Petrograd, particularly. And within days, the revolution would spread to Moscow. The revolution itself, the October Revolution, showed how far political authority had simply collapsed in Russia. Not only had the Tsarist regime in February withered away, um, uh, but also the provisional government had ceased functioning. There is that old maxim, I think by Isaac Deutsch, but I might stand corrected, that the Bolsheviks did so much se- didn't so much seize power as found it lying around. Well, Stephen Kotkin kind of finishes off that thought because the idea that the Bolsheviks in the first few days of their regime have power at all is clearly not... Um, not uh, concomitant with the facts. What it appears is that there was almost an inability for anyone to wield power in the chaos of uh, October uh, to November 1917. Now, these situations in uh, revolutionary societies rarely last because ultimately... Um, somebody, and this is something, some deep-seated human need, uh, the societies invariably kind of recreate hierarchies that somebody needs to be in charge, somebody needs to, to be running things. And the inability of perhaps anybody else to offer some kind of uh, clear leadership presents opportunities for the Bolsheviks in the end. Now, there's more to say on this topic, and I think this will be a discussion for another time. But the other element of this is how the other parties of the revolutionary left were um, dispatched, how they were got rid of. Um, initially, it was decided by Lenin, uh, overruling other, Bolshevik, other more moderate Bolsheviks, that there would be no cooperation with other revolutionary parties, even those with socialist views. Overall, the population had moved to the left, so there was little uh, chance of right-wing monarchist or restorationist or um, kind of liberal democratic um, capitalist parties from being able to uh, for have any kind of legitimacy at all. But simply because the population moved to the left, that doesn't mean to say that the Bolsheviks themselves would have popular legitimacy. And the civil war shows there's a, in wide swathes of Russia that they didn't do. Um, but we will come on to that in due course. Anyway, I hope you found this useful and informative and um, do catch us on the Explaining History podcast uh, Facebook group. It's always good to meet up, say hi, have a chat, all that kind of business. And I'll speak to you on the next Explaining History podcast. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.